So a bit about myself. Um, so my name is Vlad. I'm, um, I'm from Romania. I'm an, I'm an immigrant, as most of you here. I came to Canada in 2005 with the, with the dream, that North American dream, that I can make it here, I can be uh, prosperous, I can have a peaceful life. And after a while, uh, that changed completely. It was not like that. I'm an economist by profession, so I still have a day job. I have to go to work, so that pays my bills. But on the side, I realized that I have to do something for the same reason that Fred was telling us stories. So as an economist, I will tell you something completely different, but about the same thing. So I was invited here, and thank you for the invitation, uh, because Dr. Sharipova found that memo, the paper you have right now, on my Twitter feed. So that's like a, a, um, a proclamation that I wrote and that I gave to um, the local candidates uh, at, at the recent elections, and I put it into the hands of Jagmeet Singh. Probably you know who, who he is. So now he cannot unknow the word degrowth. So I will talk about degrowth for about 20 minutes. I will tell you what it is and how we can actually save the world using this, this uh, methodology. Uh, and you will see how my presentation will link with Fred's stories in just a moment. And I promise I haven't seen his presentation before. <laughs> okay, so I will try to answer five questions. So first, what is degrowth? How we can live within the limits of Earth? Can capitalism offer solutions? What does degrowth offer in opposition to capitalism? And how we can get to that degrowth society? So five questions. So degrowth is a planned and democratic reduction of production and consumption in rich countries. This is very important. To lower the environmental pressures and inequalities while improving well-being at the same time. So degrowth is not the opposite of economic growth, as we know it right now, but rather a call for sufficiency. That sounds very much like what, what Fred was saying. So degrowth is prosperity for all humans within planetary boundaries. So it is, it, the theory of degrowth is the culmination of 50 plus years of research in ecological economics and related sciences. So this is like a definition for what degrowth is. Essentially it comes from physics uh, in the 60s. There was an economist that in invented what it's called bioeconomics. So he linked physics with, the, with nature. So he made a connection between two and found that there's uh, an unbreakable link between nature and physics. So we have to keep that in mind. Degrowth is science, so it's not ideology. So what I mean by those planetary boundaries. So here's how an economist looks at the same question Fred was posing. So at the top in the, in the brown area, that's where most rich countries are. We over consume, we take too much from Earth. However, about 4 billion people, they are here under under consumption. They have not even reached a level where they can have a decent life. So what degrowth proposes is to bring everybody in the middle. That it's called the fair consumption space. So us in the rich countries, we have to decrease our consumption and extraction of resources from, from the earth. And the people in the global south, they need to improve their well-being. So we all meet together in the fair consumption space, which covers all aspects of human activity. So everything that we do from uh, housing, food, leisure, services, consumer goods and transport, all of that has to be in that reasonable space in the middle. Another way to look at the same problem is this circle. Do you remember what Fred showed us? There was a slide where nature looked like a, like a circle, where human was not at the top of the pyramid. So this is very similar to that. It's the same idea from uh, the eyes of an economist. So it tells the same story that humans have to sit in that green area here. So we all have to go there. Uh, we, we have to increase our social foundation, meaning all those items that you see inside the donut, all those needs have to be met for all people. And then they go into the uh, green area 
and they do not pass the ecological ceiling, which is what Mother Earth is telling us. That is the limit uh, by how far you can go. So we have to stop there. If we pass the ecological ceiling, we have all those problems that you all know from climate change, ocean acidification, the, the degradation of biodiversity, all that happens when humans go beyond the ceiling. So we have to stop at the ceiling and meet in the middle. So this is called a donut. It's a donut economics. It was created by economist Kate Raworth. She also has a book about this. Uh, the second question, how we can live within the limits of Earth, is a very difficult question. Because this graph shows where we are right now. A an average Canadian at the top today consumes 14 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per person per year. So that's how, this is the average Canadian. And it doesn't mean you in the room but on average, it takes the entire population and uh, divides it by, by how big the population is. So scientists are telling us that we have to get to 2.5 tons by 2030. So from 14 to 2.5. So this is the limit where we have to go in eight years. So uh, this report looks at, um, at consumption in, in several um, domains. So at food, housing, transport, goods, which is the things we buy from Costco, Walmart, everything objects, leisure and services that includes the vacations we take, everything that's included there. So look at housing alone. So only housing has an average footprint of three tons per person per year. Only housing. And we need to get to 2.5 for all emissions in eight years. This is a, a tremendous change for Canadians. And I have to say as an economist, it will not happen. It's impossible to happen, but we need to know what the targets are. And we, we need to uh, get to them as, as fast as, as possible. And, and also by 2050, we need to get to 0 0.7 tons in total per person per year. So why these targets? So these targets are, are created so we keep the global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, and why that the, the warming matters? Because all the problems we saw in the previous slide. If Earth gets w warmer more than 1.5 degrees, the disaster will exacerbate. So we have to uh, think about those targets. Let's look at a little bit in more detail. This is food. So this is the previous slide just zoomed in onto food. The red arrow shows you where we should be today in 2022. So we should be about here in 2022. We meat is already off the charts. We are also uh, with dairy, we, we are off the charts. By 2030, we need to get to this level, indicated by the yellow arrow, and by 2050 to this arrow. So. On the vertical axis, it shows uh, how much each item for meat, for example, how carbon intensive it is. So for example, meat, take meat, one kilogram, one kilogram of meat, like all sorts of meats, has just above eight, eight kilograms of CO2 uh, uh, emissions per kilogram of meat. One meat ha generates eight kilograms of, of uh, carbon footprint. And this includes how meat is produced, how it's transported to our stores, and all, all the, the, the processes that happen in between. Just meat alone. On the horizontal axis, it shows the amount uh, uh, we consume. So intensity matters, but also the amount on the horizontal axis. So the average Canadian consumes about 160 kilograms of meat per year. It's a lot if you look on the right side at Indonesia. So they do have a high intensity in, in meat consumption, but see the width of, the, of their consumption, they com consume much less. So taken both together, the, 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 the total footprint is much higher in Canada than in Indonesia per person. 
And Indonesia has a population of over 100 million people. Canada has 38. So, and other, other foods, all of them have a carbon footprint with different intensities and different quantities, so all of them matter. It even matters how we produce vegetables, how, how we source the water that we use for vegetables. If it's not sustainable, it will have a carbon footprint. Next slide talks about transportation. It's the same idea, but a bit more problematic. So on the left side, we see in Canada, we have to be here in 2022. So just driving cars alone, we are already past the limits. By 2030, we need to get here. And by 2050, we need to get here. On the horizontal axis, it shows how many kilometers an average Canadian drives per year. So this is 15,000 kilometers. It should be just over 5,000 by 2030, and it should drop to less than 5,000 by 2050 to keep it within targets. And remember, this is to keep warming under 1.5 degrees. These are the material targets we need to achieve. A lot of people fly a lot, so airplanes have a very intense footprint. On the vertical axis, you can see the intensity of, uh, of emissions per kilogram of gasoline used. It's very high for airplanes, for cars too. This is measured in kilograms per kilometer traveled by that person. So every kilometer you drive you, uh, using your gasoline car, you emit 0 0.5 kilograms of CO2s every kilometer. So Indonesia looks a little better. Their targets are a bit more achievable. So the, the green uh, line shows where they are now. And by 2030, they can get there much easier than Canada. And by 2050, it will be even a stretch even for in Indonesians. So the next question is capitalism. Can capitalism offer solutions? And I will tell you in a moment what I mean by capitalism. Essentially, is the economy that created all the problems Fred was talking about. It has a name, and we have to, to say the name of the system that generated all these problems. And you, I will keep talking about it. Capitalism has, has generated a lot of wealth in the past 400 years, but not for everyone. And you will see here in a moment how that wealth is distributed globally among about 8 billion people. So see, as, the, as, as uh, wealth progresses, it shows you how many people have that much wealth. Take a look at the horizontal axis. 50% of the population of Earth owns just 2% of total wealth. 10% of the population owns 75% of the wealth. And 1% of the population owns 38% of all wealth on, on Earth. So, and by wealth, for example, if you own, so forget debts, if you have a, a a wealth of like uh, savings, anything, of more than a hundred and let's say twenty thousand dollars, you are in the top ten percent of humans on Earth. Only with a hundred and twenty thousand dollars, it's euros, but convert it's about the same. If you have two point seven million dollars in wealth, so no debts, just net wealth, you are in the zero point one percent of people uh, worldwide. So. 1% of all humans have 38%. And if you look here closely, maybe it's so small you cannot see. This area right here. These are people that have less than $300 in wealth. But some of them, why is this below zero? These people, not only they don't own anything, but they're in debt. So this tiny speck here, it's about 500 million people. So 500 million people, no, no wealth, just debts. About uh, 70 million people own 38% as, as, as the rest. So, and this is what the system has generated over the 400 years in its history. Now let's look at carbon emissions. So we take the same people. The blue um, spike there, the blue tiny hill, these are the people in Canada and North America. The height of that hill shows how many people are in this region. In sub-Saharan Africa, 
the height is much higher. But in that blue line at the bottom, you can see what I talked about in a few slides before, the emissions per person. So 1 billion individuals emit less than one ton of carbon emissions per year. But people in Canada, in North America in general, those in the blue area, so that's the average of 14 tons I told you about. But see how it spreads, it starts. So these are the poor Canadians here that emit only four tons. Poor Canadians emit this much, but if you slide to the right, we go into 30 tons, 58 tons, and over 100 tons per person. So if you take a millionaire that golfs a lot and flies in private jets, that's where they are. And seven million humans on Earth emit on average 130 tons per year. That's beyond a disaster. So you remember an average Canadian has 14. Those 7 million people emit 10 times more than the average Canadian. And the average Canadian already was a disaster. That's the damage that wealth and inequality does to Earth. It's, this inequality spreads all over the spectrum of life, not just wealth in money, but also in emissions. There's also inequality. In 2015, the rich countries, also known as the Global North, have, is a nice way to say it, appropriated. But essentially, they stolen from the Global South 12 billion tons of embodied raw material equivalents. What does that mean? So if you take lithium from Africa, you ship it to China to make iPhones. And then that phone comes to Canada and you buy it. So all across this travel, of that lithium ore, you have emissions. The, the tanker that transports lithium to China e emits. Production itself emits. So if you take all those emissions in the entire chain, you embody them, you put them all together, and you get 12 billion tons that the North, the rich countries, have taken from the South. Let's move further. The North has stolen 822 million hectares of land. So that's like, a corporation goes to Africa, even Chinese corporation, and they just buy a lease for the land to, ex uh, to exploit whatever resources they find wherever in Africa, South America. So that's land that's taken for the benefits of production and from, for the benefit of expanding capitalism that the South cannot use for its, its local population. All those materials fly the countries and go to the North to make us clothes and gadgets. So the North has also taken uh, exajoule is a very high number. It's a lot of energy. So that counts fossil fuel, anything that can be extracted and moved in, in energy. They have taken 188 million person years of embodied labor. So what does this mean? If a sweatshop in, in South Asia makes t-shirts for us at 0 0.5 cents per hour, that's how much a child gets paid in Southeast uh, Asia. That's labor that was not paid by, um, um, I don't want to name names of brands, by a famous brand in North America who sells the same t-shirt for $30. So that difference is what the capitalist takes, and it's the same difference that it's stolen from the person who worked and created the, the goods for us. And in, it's not just t-shirts, even iPhones, uh, they follow the same psychology. Labor is exploited in, in the global south for the benefit of consumption in the global north. If you put a value on all these uh, things that are taken by rich countries, you get to $10 trillion in one year alone in 2015 when this, this study measured. But they look at this, this drain or theft, how I call it, uh, since 1990, and the total is $242 trillion of valuable goods and work that was taken from the South for the benefit of a luxurious lifestyle in the North. So I'm telling you these numbers not to make you feel guilty, because you are not. It's those 1% that spend too much and have a luxurious lifestyle, they, they cause this extraction and exploitation. This is equivalent of a quarter 25% of the GDP of all the rich countries. So a quarter of our economies is based on stolen material and goods from the global south. 
And now we wonder why they are poor, why they are developing countries, because we stole from them. And on the right side, it's just showing you in a bit more detail the, the ratio of how much is stolen, which is in the darker gray area at the bottom, which are imports from those countries. And at the top is how much we give them, in how much they import from us. There's also a, a big discrepancy there. I was telling you about what capitalism is. On the left, you have capitalism. And on the right, we have the economy that degrowth wants to offer. So surprisingly, it looks very much like the same circle we, we saw in Fred's presentation. Capitalism is based on this very strong relation between ownership, power, and capital. Have you ever wondered why somebody who owns shares in a company has one share, one vote, instead of one person, one vote? Why does a share give a vote? So this concept of capitalism is alien uh, to the stories Fred told us, and it's something that has to be changed in order for us to change the economy. And this is what degrowth proposes. The well-being economy creates that balance between limits of earth and well-being for everyone. It builds that green circle of prosperity. It's all about balance. Sufficiency for everyone, but nobody goes into excess. That's the whole idea. It's very simple. So we need to replace this one with that one. <laughs> That's the revolution that degrowth is proposing. So degrowth offers a lot of policy proposals. There are, there are so many, I will not read them. I'll just show them like film credits for a, a few seconds. <laughs> and then I will just cover my favorite ones. So it, it covers all aspects of human life. Uh, don't bother re uh, remembering all of these. Uh, let me just skip to the most interesting ones. So let's say in Canada. These are my top five degrowth proposals which can make the, the beginning of the transition towards that well-being economy. So imagine how life would look like if you worked only 20, 21 hours per week instead of 40 hours per week. You had half of that work time available for you, for your family, or to create meaning for yourself. Imagine how life would look like if you had a universal basic income, let's say for $2,000 per month, unconditional, whether you work or not, you would get that much money for the rest of your life. You don't have to ask for it, it's guaranteed. It's something like the SERB during the pandemic, but forever. So a lifetime SERB. That's called a universal basic income, and it's being talked about now in the Senate. So it's very plausible, it will happen very soon. So keep an eye on that one. Universal basic services, so imagine what if all the basic services we needed for life, to have a decent life, from transportation, health, education, housing, food, will be considered as a human right not a commodity, not the something that you buy on the market. Housing as a human right. If you need to live somewhere, you will be guaranteed a, a place. There are ways to do this. There are, it's a very complex subject. I will not go into the details. Workplace democracy, it's maybe close to my number one favorite uh, policy from degrowth. So capitalism has taught us that we have to accept the pyramid of power where instead of a king, we have a CEO at the top. And below him is a pyramid, so he tells everyone what to do, what to produce, how much to produce, and all those orders have to trickle down to the peasants at the bottom, the workers who have to obey the king at the top. Elon Musk is per a perfect example. If he becomes the, the owner of Twitter, he could do whatever he wanted with Twitter. He could make it pink, he could turn it upside down, because he has power. The workers have no say in that. So degrowth is suggesting to put democracy at the workplace. Just like we elect politicians for a term, so should we elect managers, executives, directors. So power will be with the people at the bottom. They will be responsible to the workers, not the opposite. If a manager fails in their duty, the workers will terminate their mandate and it so goes all the way to the top. Workers will, by consensus, they will decide what to produce, how to produce, how much, how much everyone gets paid. It will be a conversation about salaries, 
how much is too much, how much is too low. Five minutes, thank you. And uh, the last policy is having a maximum of income and wealth. We should not have billionaires or multimillionaires. One economist suggests that the maximum income, for example, in Europe, should be around $100,000. Nobody makes more than that. And that's the end of story. And in terms of wealth, about, let's say, $3 million. No, well, yes, it sounds like I will get to how it, it can get done. There are a lot of ideas from the growth for at many levels. So for communities um, uh, and also the state level. So these are just a few ideas that already exist in various places around the world and are very successful. Even here in Toronto, there's a transition town organization that has five projects along, along the lines of degrowth. They are mostly focused on food provisioning, people sharing uh, gardens in their apartments, on, uh, on porches, on lawns. There's a, a network of sharing. So there's a way of building resilience parallel to the system we have right now. People can, you can create a currency like money different than the money that the government gives. It's called an alternative currency, but don't think about Bitcoin, it's very different. It's a currency created by the community to serve the community. This is, Circles is just one example, that's their website, where people can pay each other a basic income based on trust. So if you trust the, your local business, you go to them, for, let's forget the dollar. We build a community, we, we move to Circles, I promise I'll come to you and buy from you. The system will give us a basic income in circles which, which we can spend locally. We help them, we are also helped because we, in return we offer other services that they, they need. So that's one way to create an alternative to the current system. You can have tool libraries. We don't have to buy tools anymore. We can share pretty much like Home Depot, but it doesn't have to cost anything. We can build a system where we can sh share tools that we don't need all the time. So they don't, don't just sit in our house, maybe somebody else can use it. So that's decreasing consumption and, uh, and, uh, and, and waste, pretty much. I don't have time to cover all those. There are many other good examples. Uh, maybe later, or you can reach out to me, I can tell you about them. So at the level of individuals, this is what individuals can do. This is what communities can do. This is what governments can do. I have to stress this, this is extremely important. If a, a local community has some initiatives of a resilient alternative lifestyle or something that builds solidarity, it's important but it's not enough. If we do not take on the system itself, capitalism as a system at all levels, community and government, what, the lo what an individual does will not have an impact. We will not get out of that, of that uh, disaster that we are going towards. So all these have to happen at the same time. This is very important. I can't stress this enough. Communities create local resilience, create solidarity like, like this event and anything, anything else that the community needs. They can come together and come up with, with an idea, or a platform, an app, uh, a, a website, a, a talk, anything that helps them be resilient. So those two are, are just some videos I made on my YouTube channel where, where you can learn more. I encourage you to read that book in yellow. It will come out next week. It's very interesting. So this is how degrowth can save the world. By being implemented, degrowth will create prosperity, peace, and life satisfaction. But actual prosperity is not the dream, the American dream of consumption, big house, a lot of gadgets. It's not that, it's, it's what Fred told us we can learn from indigenous peoples. They have the wisdom that we can apply in the today and now. And I, as an economist, I tell you the same story with just different words. And degrowth is just a mechanism, scientific, that can get us there. So that picture, it's, it shows how a degrowth city might look like. Um, this comes from, it's called the solar punk movement. It's a bit uh, futuristic, sci-fi-ish, so, but they have like a, a very down-to-earth approach of integrating cities with nature. You don't need Star Trek for that. So that can happen today and now if we change the system that we live in. And, and degrowth is the, 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 the methods, the tools that can help us get there.
that's it for me. Thank you. Probably you don't know, I, I am an educator also, so I make videos about all these things. So if you want to learn more, I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and there's way more information there. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, because you are telling that capitalism, capitalism is promoting the global warming because uh, according to your statements, capitalism, because if you, 1% of the billionaires uh, those who are harboring about 37% of the global wealth. So they are producing more emissions and more carbon dioxide emissions and ultimately to the global warming and climate change. But you are telling another thing, democracy. Do you think democracy is the solution, uh, de democracy is the solution to the degrowthing of the climate change? Because if majority of the uh, people, they go in the wrong way uh, in the democracy, then the decision will be wrong in the workplace, as you, as you said in the work. I don't think so. So democracy in the workplace versus capitalism. Do you think it's a balanced solution for the degrowthing? Uh, I don't think so. Because if capitalism and democracy, they go parallel, you know? They go parallel. They are, uh, they are, uh, uh, they are supportive to each other. They are supportive to each other. They, they should, yes. Capitalism, yeah. So that is the one thing how you will comment on that. Yes, so thank you for the question. I, it's very interesting and, and I love it because, yes. Um, so when, when it comes to democracy and capitalism, so I'll, I'll take that first. Um, so democracy is a, is a very broad subject. Um, democracy is, it comes from Greek. It actually means the power of the people. It's, the idea is 2,000 years old. But when you put it in practice, it can mean many things. Political democracy is just one way of looking at it, how we elect governments to represent us, just, just one way. Economic democracy, what I talk about, is a different way of looking at democracy, but from an economic perspective. What you're suggesting that, let's let people decide what's best for, for the climate. So yes, democracy can make a difference, but Democracy does not operate in a void. So climate change is a, is a scientific problem. So the scientific community comes up with all the data I showed you, then there's many more. The IPCC from the United Nations tell us what the science says. People think about, okay, do I want to live in a world that is on fire? Do you think they will vote to be on fire or not to be on fire? You know, so it's a question of, of uh, subsistence. You, we cannot impose policies from the top to tell people this is how you should live to, to save the planet. It has not worked. We tried that already. For 50 years capitalism has tried green growth. You know, it hasn't worked. So the alternative is to degrow the economy and let people decide in their local community what's best for them. If they don't want their house to uh, be taken by a river in a flood, they'll think better about the, what the scientific community suggests. You know, so I trust the people, they will go into the right decision because the alternative to democracy is totalitarianism. 